To be in his presence was quite awe-inspiring. I remember after 10 minutes I was completely blown away. That was for me a musical explosion. His influence is enormous in the musical world, enormous. I said good morning. <laughs> Excuse me, please. I feel good morning. He was a revolutionary. When he started, he was really like one against the world. This was a world premiere for me. I have never before heard that. Ta-da! Ta-da! Please keep that. It's, it's really good. People never expected him to say things he did or to show you things that, that he did. When I, when I met him, actually everything changed completely. My, com my, my view of music changed. It was really, it was mind-blowing. It was just, I could not believe it. He was on a journey and uh, wasn't, wasn't preoccupied with his career or with what he was doing next week. He was just there in that moment in the score. He did the sparking. He was a great big spark plug and we reacted to his power and intensity. He was full of very visual descriptions of the music we were playing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it should be like that. Uh, we visit in Dracula's castle. You knew exactly what he was talking about, an over-exaggeration of, of, of any musical context. We have dum 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 Very, very short, very short, like a, like a cork out of the bottle. You know, when, when he wanted to have a crescendo like a crocodile yeah. mouth, which just opens like, like this. Yeah. So that it must like, like a, a 10 meter crocodile opens his mouth. Once he was talking about some sort of a sound and he said everyone should sound like a horn, he said the whole orchestra should sound horny. Bah. Bah. You, 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 you have always this, this problem that an that, uh, uh, enormous elephant is standing on your leg. One of the best things, I think, was when he said something, you have to play like, like going wild or whatever, and suddenly you drop down and said, no, all the bananas are sold out. <laughs> when Hanukkah did something, it was so clear because of all his research he did before the, before the rehearsals. He, does, he doesn't want to make beautiful music, he just wanted to tell a story. He, he loved the ugly in the music t at times, in, in, uh, if it was balanced out with the sheer beauty. If you're just looking for, for beauty, a nice sound, beautifully shaped, everything's in tune, it doesn't say much. I think it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. This, this, but this is either it is fantastic or it's not good. His sort of career was completely um, uh, tainted by the whole of the Second World War and, and his, his family was chucked out of their house in, by the Nazis in, uh, in, in Steins and uh, he was in fact born I think in Berlin so he knew very well what it meant to start from scratch and, and to also follow, follow his, his beliefs. No, 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 please not. Sleep well, dear elephant. He was an, an, an egotistical person who needed affirmation. So in that sense, I think he was, I think there was a certain degree of humility in the way he, way he approached what he did. He was an obsessive, um, evangelistic musician for his, his way of thinking and his historical perspective on how music has to be played. I mean, the only contradiction could come from himself. Hanukkah had phenomenal energy. He was almost like Elvis Presley on stage. He was incredible, very charismatic. I suddenly noticed that the Hanukkah's both feet were off the ground at the same time. This was a, a man in his late 70s and both feet, he jumped 
um, with the excitement of the music. And when he was talking about music, he was like a teenager. The light in his eyes and the, the curious, uh, yeah, like, a, like you had the feeling it was the first time he was talking about this in his life. Usually in rehearsals we didn't play a lot. There was lots of storytelling by him. So we, that was a problem for us because we sometimes did play a piece through the first time in the channel rehearsal. <laughs> we have, have hardly played it. If it was something, something uh, not very well known, it was a bit tricky. He never took what he was offered. He always found a way of getting out of us what he wanted. I think that beauty can be only found on the edge of failing. So go one step on, one step on, and when we have too much steps, we break down. The beauty is, is on the edge of, of catastrophe. And, and may, don't forget that. It was important for him to, uh, to recognize that you can't just have either beauty or, or ugliness or extreme. You need to have a balance between the two. And you find, you find the beauty, he always used this word, at the edge of, of catastrophe. So you, you need to be able to go to the extreme on one side and to the extreme on the other side. And then the two things will, will make sense. Yeah. If, if possible, if possible, play without any vibrato. With my, eh, 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 like, like whistles. Sometimes he wanted beauty and sometimes he wanted attack. Sometimes he wanted life isn't always beautiful. He brought that out too. If while playing you were focusing on your instrument sound, which for him it was the last thing you should think, you know. If he could hear the sound of your violin, like a violin, he couldn't stand it. He wanted you to focus on what's the meaning of that music and that should be a sound that mix, I don't know, if violins play with the oboe should create, you know, a chemistry, should an alchemy of sound. So if you are there looking for your beautiful violin sound, you ruin this. Everybody Haydn did all his beautiful entrances of slow, slow entrances. And now Beethoven comes in with the dissonance, which, which is absolute, it's, it's really very typical. And, and they said, how crude, even, even 30 years after that, they said, it's, it's, a, it's a crude piece, one cannot stand it. So please make, ah, uh, so why, why is he coming in, into the scene after Mozart and, and Haydn? Please. If he would listen to the orchestra now, he would, I think he would say, well, a great orchestra plays together, is in tune, but it doesn't matter if he would, would, would play exactly his style, he would still come and change things. There is uh, no moment now, in, in, I don't know if it's the same for you, in my life, when I play something that I don't ask myself how Hanoko would ask or would do this or would ask me to do this. Even when I practice or play, I, I sometimes think what would he have, what would he have said about, about this? What, what would, what would he think about what, I, what I'm doing here? These things just stay with you. They, they don't make a, a, a sort of daily impression that will last, you know, for a few days. They're, they're, they're life-lasting, what he talked about in music and his um, desire to uncover music and to clear away, as he often put it, clear away the varnish uh, of the centuries of performance um, to uncover what, what was very pure and, and very beautiful and very strong. That was always his, his idea. Being asked how the orchestra might have been had we not been closely involved with Harnoncourt, is I find is a bit like being asked how would one be if one of one's parents had been someone else. If we want to keep COE what COE is, we have to keep going, you know, like he's still there and, and questioning ourselves, okay, how we would do this. Extremely important. One should expect a forte and one gets a piano. That means do 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 nothing. But you must think that it a forte comes until the first note of the bar. And he says the real beauty of, 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 of music is just before it goes wrong. So go for it 
And if it goes wrong, you're just unlucky. <laughs>